1 Corinthians chapter 4. One of the great things about reading the Bible regularly and completely in a verse-by-verse fashion is it allows you to see common verses in a different light. Verses uh, take on their proper meaning when they're read and understood and applied in their context. And uh, we're going to begin tonight, we're going to bounce around a little bit, uh, in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Paul here says, let a man so consider us, that's him and Apollos, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in in stewards that one be found faithful. Now, we briefly looked at these verses before. Our goal earlier in this series that we've been in was to uh, see that Paul was uh, being judged by these Corinthians and he was addressing the issue of motives and how Even in verse 5, God's going to bring everything to light. He's the true motive judger. Um, But when you look at 0 and verses 1 and 2, what we see is servanthood, stewardship, and faithfulness. And these things are something that God values tremendously relative to you as his child. Good stewardship is mentioned throughout the scriptures. We often talk about when it comes to being good steward of financial resources, and obviously that's important, but we're to be a good steward of everything that God has given us, including finances. But in this case, the stewardship has to do with the teaching of the Word of God. Paul and Apollos were gifted from the Lord. They had a call from the Lord to speak the Word of God and even communicate, as it says here, the mysteries of God. And they were to do it faithfully as good stewards, And it's no different for you and for me. 1 Peter 4.10 tells us, Every man has received the gift, and so we're all spiritually gifted here to minister, and so we're to minister that gift to one another. Notice it's good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God's calling is God's enabling by grace through the equipping process as we learn the scriptures and so forth. And so we're to be stewards of the grace of God, good stewards, And that's our position in Christ. And when it came to Paul being evaluated by these carnal Corinthians, he wanted them to understand uh, a couple different things here relative to himself, and this is true of you and me. As a believer in Christ, you're to see yourself as a servant and as a steward. That's how you're to view yourself, as a servant, as a steward. Now, if you recall, a steward owned nothing but was given the responsibility of managing what his owner had given to him. Stewards are responsible for managing and distributing the resources that they were entrusted with. And so Paul here tells us that he was given a stewardship to teach the word of God. He's a minister that belongs to God. In fact, he says, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards in the mysteries of God. That word servant there is Normally, a lot of times he used the word doulos, which is the word for slave, but this is a word that's for a specific kind of slave, the lowest ranking slave. Huperetis, it literally means under rowers. It was used, uh, there were three levels of rowing in, in ships, and you, the under rower was the lowest tier, which, and we know everything falls downhill, so it was like the last place you wanted to be. And so it was the lowest galley slave, one's rowing in the bottom tier of the ship, They were the most menial, unenvied, and despised of slaves. And Paul says, that's how I want you to consider me. And really, the term came to me to refer to subordinates of any sort that came under the authority of another, but he wanted everyone else to consider him, and all of God's ministers, is that. Galley slaves were not exalted one above another. They were all equally on the lower end of the totem pole, if you will. And so you're to see yourself as a servant of Christ. Notice he says, I'm the minister of Christ. He recognized Christ was his authority. And life gets a whole lot simpler when you see yourself as a minister of Christ versus some other context. 
But you know, you can't serve your Savior rightly unless, or excuse me, you can't serve men rightly unless you serve your Savior rightly. And you cannot serve him rightly unless you see yourselves rightly as an underserve, as an under rower, as a lowest galley slave. That's how there's much freedom uh, in your life when you view yourself from that perspective. And so I trust tonight that you see yourself as a steward, someone who's been given the responsibility to manage something for his owner, and you're to do it as a slave of Christ. If you're going to be effective for Christ and you're going to make a difference, that mindset is very, very critical. But you're also to do it faithfully. This is what God is looking at. It's required. It's not just suggested. It's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Now, you have a volition. You can have a different perspective. You can view this as optional. You could ignore what God wants and simply seek to live life on your terms. And so in that sense, it is optional because the appeal to the believer in Christ is to present himself or herself as a living sacrifice based on the mercy God has shown you. Romans 12.1, we cite it frequently. Therefore, he says, I urge you. He says, I don't demand you, but I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, that you would offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true worship. You know, that's the only reasonable thing to do. Everything else is unreasonable. And so God, because of the mercy he's shown you, makes an appeal to yield yourself to him because the reality is he's given you a stewardship. And he wants you to fulfill it because you will be judged on whether or not you fulfilled that stewardship. And so as far as God is concerned, and since his opinion is the only one that matters, the issue in doing anything for Christ is are you being faithful to him? For Paul and for Apollos, that was the issue. Were they going to be faithful to the word of God? Were they, were they going to rightly divide the word of truth and, and teach it in a way that was consistent with grace and that honored the Lord? This was Paul's objective with Timothy. Later in this epistle, he says, for this reason, in this chapter even, I've sent you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. We know from Philippians that at that point in time when he was writing that epistle, the only one he could send was Timothy, who was faithful. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere and in every church. Now Paul here was in, says he was entrusted with the mysteries of God. He was entrusted with the gospel and the truths that God wants his church to know and to understand and apply. He dispensed these truths. He recognized the importance of being faithful to the task given to him and handling the word of God accurately and faithfully. And when it comes to handling the word of God, accuracy is paramount. Now go with me, if you will, to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. This is how strong Paul felt under the leading of the Holy Spirit about the accuracy of the gospel, verse 8. But if even if we, includes himself, or an angel from heaven or anyone else, preach any other gospel to you than that which we preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, and so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Strong words, Paul. Why are the strong words? Well, notice verse 6. He says, I marvel, I'm absolutely flabbergasted that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel. These believers were being drawn away. And notice, you're drawn away from a person when you adopt another doctrine. Verse 6 says, you're turning away from God. Isn't that interesting? You're turning away from him who called you to the grace of Christ to a different gospel. You're turning away from the grace of Christ to 
to a different gospel, notice verse 7, which is not another because there's only one gospel, but there are some who would trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. See, you leave the gospel of grace and you exchange it for another message, you leave God. You're estranged from God. And this is why, even in Galatians 4, what did Paul say to these believers later in this epistle? You are trying to be justified by the law have been what? Alienated from Christ. When you adopt a different orthodoxy, a different that's the word I'm looking for. System of teaching, a different philosophy, whatever it is, you actually, in fact, the King James says you've severed yourself from Christ. That sounds kind of harsh, but you've been alienated from him. You've fallen away from the principle of grace. That's what happens when you get a law orientation in your thinking. When you adopt false teaching, you actually alienate yourself from the Lord. Have you ever looked at it in those terms? Interesting, isn't it? See, the gospel is centered in the grace of Christ, and when you change it in any way, you turn it from grace to something else. In fact, verse 7 says you pervert it. You pervert the gospel. You ruin it. You change it from a message that saves to one that doesn't, thereby in many cases making the one who embraces the false message of the gospel a twofold child of hell than they were before because now they think they've adopted something that's correct when in fact it's wrong. And usually when someone adopts something and they make a change, like you go from Roman Catholicism to Mormonism, you can hardly reach them now because they think they finally found the answer. When it's another form of religion that will ruin them. It's amazing. In Acts 20, Paul called the message he preached the gospel of the grace of God. Something that we are to preach faithfully. Now Paul declared for us what the gospel is. Since we're close, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15. And notice verse 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received in which you stand. Notice, he preached the gospel. They received it. By which also you're saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. How do they receive it? They believed it. And now he, de now he declares the message he preached. I declare to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, and that the th he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel message. And we've seen this several times, but you can't be clear enough. The gospel of salvation centers in a specific person. It's Jesus Christ. It doesn't center in a church. It doesn't center in a priest. It doesn't center in a man of any kind. It centers in Christ. And this is significant because of who Christ is. He is the unique God-man. He's the one meter between God and man. He is the only one that can save. And so the gospel, the saving message, would have to center on him. Any other message you preach is the wrong message. And we know that the gospel of salvation centers in a specific, specific work. The work that Christ did was that he died and that he arose again. But that in and of itself means nothing. It's what was accomplished there. Christ died for our sins and in doing so paid the price that you and I could never pay because someone in God's justice system had to pay for our sins. And Christ did that. The message of salvation is centered in what a person did for us outside of us and in spite of us, because he loved us. You know, you need to remember that salvation has nothing to do with you and me. But, you know, this message does need to be received. And you're receiving a person, the person who did the work for you. And the moment you do that, the moment you believe on his name, you become a child of God. Your sins are forgiven. You're now on your way to heaven, guaranteed, is nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. But salvation is the work of God for man. It's not the work of man for God. And this hit me in a new way just studying out this passage we're going to look at here shortly. It's the actual impartation of eternal life. It's not the artificial 
imitation of ethical living. A lot of times people think that Christianity is a lifestyle. No, it's actually receiving everlasting life. It's the imputed righteousness of God. It's not the imperfect righteousness of man. God imputes to your account a righteousness of Christ that makes you acceptable to him. He sees you in Christ and accepts you just like he accepts his son. It's according to the faithful calling of God. It's not the fitful carefulness of man that makes you acceptable to him. It's a divine reconciliation. It's not a human regulation, as oftentimes people view it as such. It's the canceling of all sin. It's not the cessation of some sin. It's being delivered from and dead to the law. It's not delighting in or doing the law. It has nothing to do with it. The law did its job when it drove you to Jesus Christ. And then that schoolmaster retired, if you will. Being made, it's being made acceptable to God. It's not become exceptionally good. It's completeness in Christ. It's not competency in character. It's possessing every spiritual blessing. Not, it is not possessing any special betterment. It's not like you're something because God saved you by grace, as some people look at it that way. It's only and always of God. It's never of man because of what Christ did. You know, sometimes people think that the gospel is all the moral teaching of Jesus. It's not the gospel. It's not the golden rule. It's not some behavior modification program. It's not something that's unfinished yet to be completed. It's the finished work of Christ. Here's the ESV version of Hebrews 10.12. When Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. I like that, for all time. He sat down to the right hand of God because the work was done. It can't be added to or approved. In fact, later in Hebrews 10, it says where the remission of these sins are, there's no more offering for sin because Christ was the final sacrifice. And so the gospel is about what Christ did for you and for me. It's not an example of how to live in order to be right with God. The gospel doesn't demand our very best. It's a free gift. And for those that think, well, faith without works is dead, you need to recognize that works proceed from the righteous life of Christ who lives in you. Once you trust Christ, the issue of the doing good works that God has left you here to do is allowing him to work in you and through you so the good works that he's prepared beforehand are a byproduct of you walking with him. This is why we're told to continue to work out the salvation that we already possess. We're not trying to get it. We already have it. But we're working out what is ours. How do we do that? It's God who works in you both to will and to do or to act in order to fulfill his good pleasure. That's why salvation in all three tenses is of God. It's not of us. So encouraging. And so Paul was a stickler when it came to the message of the gospel. He made it abundantly clear that it cannot be added to. It cannot be subtracted from. He said in Galatians 1 that I, the same way I received it from direct revelation of the Lord, I preached it to you, and that's how you are to preach it to others. But he also recognized the responsibility that God gave him to preach it because in 1 Corinthians 9 he said this, if I preach the gospel, I have nothing, nothing to boast of why. Necessity has been laid upon me. In fact, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. Now, if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if it's against my will, regardless, I'm going to give an account of my stewardship. Isn't that interesting? And so this is another reward passage. And this is what we've been going over. We've asked the question, though, one who's been saved by the grace of God through his faith in Jesus Christ alone and Christ's death for their sins cannot lose their salvation. What can they lose? You can lose, first of all, your reward in heaven. We've seen this several times, and I'm going to probably, you should be able to say it back to me just like I've been saying it because I've done it like for the ninth time now. We've seen in 1 Corinthians 3 that if any man's work abide, as everyone... God has left everyone on this planet who is saved to do his will, to finish their work. Now, if you do it, and when it's put to the test, it shows to be worthy of the Lord, you'll receive reward. 
if your work is not worthy, if it was produced by the flesh, you're going to suffer loss. What loss of reward? Even though you yourself shall be saved. This is why 1 Corinthians 3, Paul said, one who plants and one who waters have one purpose, and they're each going to be rewarded according to their own labor. Their own labor. Very important. So you are either, you've got two stacks going here. You've got a brush pile going, or you've got a, gold of, or a stack of gold, silver, and precious stones going. But the day will declare it. You and I will give an account. We've been handed a stewardship. The issue is what do we do with it? And so we saw that your post-salvation life will be evaluated at judgment seat of Christ. This is not a place where God meets out punishment for sins because they were all paid for in full by the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. And so what will Christ be looking at? Now we've seen several times it's what is going on in the inside that is paramount. The value of the deed is connected with the attitude of the heart as far as God is concerned. And we've seen that these are the things Christ will be looking at, a joyful acceptance of injustice when serving Christ. He's going to be looking at what we did with what he gave us financially because it was all his and what do we do with his stuff? Part of that is hospitality. Your willingness to minister to those in need out of love. Christ is going to evaluate your motives and all that you do. We saw last time, that, or last couple times ago, that when you're faithful in your vocation, regardless of how you're treated, that this is something the Lord is going to look at. Last time we looked at loving the unlovable. Christ said in, in Luke 6 that it's easy to love those who love you. The real test of agape love is loving someone who is not lovable, just like Christ loved you when you were unlovable. That's what agape love does. But notice these verses we just looked at. You're going to be rewarded if you fulfill your ministry willingly. If you fulfill your ministry willingly. Isn't that what we just read? Fulfill your ministry willingly. Paul says, I have been given a stewardship. My stewardship is to preach the gospel Woe is unto me if I don't do it. But he says, if I'm willing to do this, I have a reward. And you think, well, I haven't been given an official ministry. Well, you've been given a ministry. Remember, 1 Peter 4 says, we're all ministers. And we're to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So God has a ministry for you. In your home, in your neighborhood, on your job, whatever it is. You are to willingly serve Christ in whatever it is he's called you to do. If you do it willingly, you get a reward. If you don't, if it's drudgery, if it's mere obligation and robotic, well, then you lose out on the reward. You know, before Paul got his head chopped off, he said to Timothy at the end of his epistle to him, the second epistle, but you be sober in all things, you endure hardship, you do the work of an evangelist. This is why you're here, Timothy. Fulfill your ministry. I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering. My time is done. The time of my, spelling there, departure has come. I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. In the future, there's later for me a crown of righteousness. That is a reward. The reason Paul got that is because he what? Fulfilled his ministry. He says, the Lord, the righteous judge, will award who's, <laughs> award me on that day. And not only me, to, but to all those who have loved his appearing. The thing that drove Paul was the fact that Christ was coming back at any moment, and he wanted to redeem the time. And so you've been given a ministry to fulfill. Do you ever look at your life that way? I mean, is your life consumed with, I've got things to do, people to see, lawns to mow, whatever it might be. And it's just 
let me see if I can scratch another thing off my list, or do you recognize that it's beyond the details of life, that people matter, and that you can impact people in your life as a good steward of the manifold grace of God. God has left you on this planet to fulfill the good works he's left you here to do. If you do it willingly, you get a reward. That's the good news. So that's one item that you need to be aware of. But there's another thing that we see that God is going to count. It's doctrinal integrity. And go with me to the epistle of Second John. Doctrinal integrity. Something that isn't really thought about much in our day. But this is something John makes an issue with in this second epistle that he wrote. Second John makes clear what our position should be regarding the enemies of the truth. First John focuses on our fellowship with God. Second John focuses on protecting our fellowship from those who teach falsehood. Verse 1 tells us it's to the elect lady. And there's some debate about who that is or if that's just a term for the church. But he says here, we'll pick it up in verse 4, I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we received the commandment from the Father. And now I pleaded with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that, as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Why, verse 7? For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we have worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Interesting. Now, God, John here communicates through these connections that love towards fellow believers needs to be practiced with some discernment. Love has standards. It discerns biblical principle, if you will. It's interesting he says, we're to walk in love. This is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that you have heard from me, being that you should walk in it. So when you're walking in love, you're walking in the commandments of the Lord. And then we have a connective four in verse seven. The reason you need to do that is because there's many deceivers in the world. Many deceivers. And the way you actually stem these deceivers that want to enter into the church or are entered into the church or whatever it might be that are infiltrating the church is to walk in his commandments in love. Isn't that interesting? And he says there's many, isn't that interesting? Verse 7, there's many deceivers that have gone out into the world. You know, in 1 John 4, 1, Christ, or John called these false prophets, and here he calls them deceivers. False prophets was descriptive of their role. This is the description of their effect. And there's many deceivers. There's a widespread movement that, from God's perspective, present a real danger to believers. In fact, deceivers translates the plural form of planos, which really means a wanderer. We get our English word planner from this. It refers to those who wander from the truth of Scripture, who corrupt it, who lead others astray in it. They're imposters. Paul called them in Galatians chapter 2, false brethren. Jude calls them as wandering stars headed for a black darkness of eternal judgment. 
And it's interesting. It says, many deceivers have gone out into the world. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? They've gone out into the world. In other words, these false teachers have been sent out, if you will, on a demonic mission. I like Smalley here. He depicts this contrast. Whereas the orthodox followers of Jesus... What is this nonsense? Smalley depicts the contrast. Whereas the orthodox followers of Jesus are sent out into the world to preach the truth, the heretics went out as itinerary emissaries of the devil to teach error and gain converts for their own cause. They were sent out. They've gone out into the world. Now, it's interesting. If you're walking in love, or walking in truth, rather, you're going to be loving others, but love discerns. We're to be cautious whom we love. As a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what you're not to love? Antichrist. The end of verse 7 says, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. He's saying those who are committed to biblical truth and exalting the grace of God cannot have fellowship with those who pervert it. I mean, if you think about the ecumenical movement and the line of thinking behind it, they would say we're, we need to love everyone the same. We're all just Christians here, right? But are we? And is this what the Lord is telling us to do? See, John did not leave love undefined, but described as walking according to God's commandments. And there's a number of commandments. to talk about separating from false teaching. You know, you can't have true love apart from the truth because truth is what defines love. The world's definition of love is some kind of tolerance of everything that is right or everything that's wrong. And you can actually be intolerant of that which is right and still be considered loving in the world. But the Bible says love rejoices in the truth. You know, I was asked a question here by a seven-year-old recently. If God is love and he loves everybody, does he love Satan? You know, God is love, but do you realize his love discerns, it discriminates, if you will? It's a righteous love. You know, the Bible also says that God hates. So can God love and hate at the same time? Yeah, he can. He hates falsehood. And he hates Satan. Because it says in John 44, John 8, 44, that there's no truth in Satan. God's love is not applied towards Satan. God loves mankind. In fact, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus Christ never died for the sins of demons. He died for the sins of mankind. It never says that he loves demons. Satan is God's arch enemy. He'll be judged eternally, and he'll be put in a place called the lake of fire, which is a place where God's love is not. You know, we're to love our enemies, but that is in the context of a personal relationship, not doctrinal deceivers. And that's where you need to be discerning. We're to hate false teaching and stand against false teaching, and we're to stand against false teachers. Deceivers and false teachers have infiltrated the church. And in this case here, they were attacking the person of Jesus Christ. The specific error that John was addressing here was there was those who taught that Jesus Christ wasn't fully human. You know, all major cults attack the person of Jesus Christ. If you look at the Mormons or the Jehovah Witnesses, they attack the deity of Christ. But at this time in history, when John wrote, the heresy going around was that Jesus Christ wasn't fully human. They held that the flesh was inherently evil. They claimed that Jesus Christ only seemed to have a human body. 
because such a union of divine and human was inherently impossible. It's called doceticism. And so John is warning these saints that there's a false teaching going on there about Christ and you need to be aware of it. In fact, this is how strong he felt about it, verse 10. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, that Jesus Christ is God, and he was fully human, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. That doesn't sound very loving. That's God's definition of love right there when it came to a false teacher. See, love can mean separating from someone. Verse 11 says, For who, he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Holy cow, that's a little strong, isn't it? That's God's perspective. You know, we live in a day and age where, boy, if, if you call someone a false teacher, they might burn your house down. That is so unloving. Is it? You know, when Paul met with the Ephesian elders. He says, I'm not going to see you again. He says, you take heed, therefore, to yourselves and all the flock, for I know this, after my departing, grievous wolves. Well, that's not very nice. Will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And here's the sad part. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. You know, this is what love does in his first epistle. John said, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you recognize the spirit of God. If every spirit acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming even now is already in the world. He says you need to be discerning. And so you're to love, but love has its limits as truth allows. You know, it's interesting. Much of the New Testament contains warnings relative to false teaching. Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. They look and sound good, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. Relative to the Pharisees and Sadducees, Jesus said, be careful. Be on your guard against the yeast or leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The agents of Satan are perpetually seeking to undermine the clarity of the gospel and the response to the gospel. This is why his chief trump is religion. You get someone that thinks they're a Christian, feels like a Christian, hangs out with Christians, they must be a Christian. And then boom. He successfully confused the minds of those who don't believe. And so he's worked in such a way that truth and love have been redefined. And he's worked in such a way that God's grace is misunderstood or misapplied. What did Paul tell the Colossians? Beware lest anyone spoil you, ruin you through philosophy, steal you, and vain deceit after their tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And so we have a command in verse 8. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things which we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. So every believer is to be on guard. That's what he's saying here. When it says, look to yourselves, look is the Greek word blepo. It can mean physically see, but when it's used figuratively, it means to discern mentally, to consider, to contemplate, to take heed to yourself, to have your brain engaged, to be discerning. 
of what is being taught. Why is this so important? Because you can lose those things you've worked for. You know, having labored in the lives of this church and her children, John wanted to see the full fruit of that effort. He doesn't want them to lose what has been accomplished and the spiritual growth and ministry for the Lord. This is why I even said, this is what Paul said to the Corinthians who were carnal. He says, I wish that you would bear with me a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. This is sarcasm. For I betrothed you to one husband so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid that this, as the serpent deceived Eve through his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we've not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. In other words, you'll accept this guy. He was concerned. You're going to lose ground spiritually. This is why he rebuked the Galatians, you foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? As the false teachers were drawing them away from grace and saying that keeping the law is how you live the Christian life. In fact, that's how you're justified. You know, believers can go backward spiritually. This isn't anything new. But they can do so for different reasons. If you look, consider the Hebrews here, their problem was they were dull of hearing. They were sluggish. They weren't listening. They weren't paying attention. By this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. In fact, you've come to the point where you need milk. You can't even handle solid food. Everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. Well, I'm having trouble today. He is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That speaks of maturity. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You could be spiritual, ap spiritually apathetic, you don't think on things above. You don't take in the word of God. You don't meditate on it. You don't pray. You lollygag along. And you don't even know you're out of it. That's very possible. They were spiritually apathetic. There was a deliberate refusal to trust the Lord in their difficult circumstances. Now the issue that John's making here and the issue that Paul made with the Galatians was false teaching. If they yield to these false teachers, they'll destroy the spiritual growth they've experienced through their acceptance of the true apostolic message. <clears throat> if they allow their opponents to proselytize unopposed in the church or even in the community in which they live, all the effective work accomplished to this point by the recipients of the letter would be in danger of being lost. The church would be ruined through false teaching. And throughout history, how many churches have been ruined through false teaching? How many churches can you walk in today that are evangelical where you'll hear a gospel message preached? And if you hear it preached, is it going to be accurate? Is it going to focus on Christ? Is the response to the gospel going to be the one response given in the New Testament, which is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? This has started in the first century and it's picked up a lot of steam. So the stakes are high. You lose what you've worked for. But you can also lose a full reward. Isn't that what verse 8 tells us? Look to yourselves. We do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. The word for reward there means the wages you have coming to you. I like what Smalley says here. The image is drawn from the area of employment since reward 
is a term for a workman's wage. The expression of full reward, a reward in full or reward that attains to full possibility. False teaching strips you of the, all the reward you could have. And yet, if you take a stand on the Word of God today, you're viewed as unloving and critical and judgmental. Like, you know, what did... Let's, let's go to the book of Revelation for a second. Revelation chapter 3, just a couple pages to your right. What did Christ say to the church at Philadelphia, beginning in verse 7? And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things says, He who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength. You've kept my word. You've not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will... Make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you've kept my commandments to persevere, I will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have that no one may take your crown. Isn't that interesting? That no one may take your crown. And so if you think of this church here, God says, I have given you an open door. It's Church of Philadelphia. It's an open door to either evangelize or to minister in some capacity, all based on God's grace. I think minimally it means to evangelize, though, they're in their sphere of influence. Maybe it was some other avenue of impact within the church that we don't know about. But he says, I am giving you an opportunity here. It's a perfect act of indicative and indicative that Christ has set this opportunity before them. It remains open, an open opportunity for them. And so Christ says, I've given you this door of ministry, this, this door of service. And since I opened it up, no one can shut it. You know, it reminds me, if you look at the book of Acts, that Paul wanted to go to, where was it? Bithynia. And the Lord says, nope, I'm shutting that door. Then he wanted to go somewhere else, and God shut the door. And he ended up going to Troas, and God gave him a vision from the man of Macedonia. and says, come over here and help us. And Paul responded immediately. God opened the door of ministry. And when God opens the door, no one shuts it. This is what Paul prayed in prison. Meanwhile, I pray also for us that God would open to us a door for the word, an opportunity to speak the mystery of Christ, which I am also in chains. Paul says, I'm looking for open doors. Will you pray that God will open it and I'll see it? Do you look for open doors? Do you think in terms that God will open up a door? You know, you know who he opens up doors for? Those who are willing to walk through them. He said, Lord, help me kick a door in. No, he said, Lord, open the door yourself so I can walk in it and minister for you in some capacity. But notice verse 8. This is Christ's evaluation of them. I know your works, and I've sent before you an open door so you can work, and no one can shut it. You have little strength, but notice you've kept my word and you haven't denied my name. In other words, these people were faithful. Christ commended them for having kept their, his word. They've guarded the truth that it was committed to them. They didn't depart from the faith. They persevered and preserved the truth in the face of difficulty. It says, they haven't denied my name. Spiritual fidelity and separation from the world. They took a stand on the truth in love. 
So these believers were faithful. You know, Christ, I think, is going to give us an open door to the degree we're faithful. But there's only one command given to this church. Verse 11. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have. That's the command, that no one may take your crown. Hold fast. Hold fast means to keep carefully, to don't discard or let go. It's a present active imperative. And it's in the context of rewards. Behold, I am coming quickly. Now, quickly means in, in the book of Revelation, suddenly, unexpectedly, without announcement, not necessarily soon. But since there's imminency there, there's never not a time to hold fast. A warning against spiritual carelessness and carnality. Oh. Hold fast to the truth that's delivered to you. Continue to faithfully serve. Because what's at stake? Let no one take your crown. A crown, as you know, is a reward for faithful service. And so as we think of what John is telling us, as we go back to Second John, what does he say? Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things which you work for, that you may receive a full reward. Compromising doctrinally will cost you a full reward. You know, this is why Paul wrote First and Second Timothy. Notice, Christ said in Revelation twenty two twelve, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. These are the last words of Christ in the book of Revelation underscoring the importance of being a faithful steward. But the last verses in 1 Timothy 6, he says, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. In fact, the King James says, oh, Timothy, oh, Timothy, guard, keep, Turn away from godless chatter and opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in doing so have wandered from the faith. You know, it's interesting. The word Timothy means he who honors God, and Paul is saying, Oh, Timothy, you who honor God, God, honor him by keeping what has been entrusted to you. Vigilantly protect it. It was used of a military sentry or a prison guard. It was used when describing how the shepherds watched their flock by night. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel message. And I will fight to keep it clear. The stakes cannot be any higher. It has to be guarded and protected, kept pure. How important is sound doctrine to you? How important? You know, I was talking to Pastor Pete, who moved out to Tucson. And it's a church made up of people that have retired to that area, and they come from all different kinds of backgrounds. And... They, in many cases, have not been taught things clearly. And so as Pete teaches a Friday study and he teaches Wednesday nights. And people are starting to see things they never saw before. But an observation as we talked was that here there's people that are very positive toward the Lord and then haven't been taught real well. And they're coming along and he said, you know, I, I left a place where a lot of people understood the truth very clearly and just didn't care. 
And so here's someone running the risk of not having a full reward because they that worship Christ must worship him in spirit and in truth. And I don't care how sincere you are, if it's not true, God isn't honored by it. And then you have people that have been taught the grace of God, understand biblical principle, and have blown it off to go do something else. To me, it's amazing. How important is sound doctrine to you? I mean, what did Jude say? Or here, first, this is in the second epistle, what did Paul tell Timothy? Hold fast that form of sound words which you have heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed or entrusted to you, keep same word by the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. Jesus says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should what? Earnestly contend for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. Are you willing to earnestly contend for the faith because you love Jesus Christ and that you want a full reward and you recognize it's the truth that sets you free? This was once and for all. The word once there means delivered once and for all. In fact, earnestly, it's funny that word contend. We're running out of time. That word contend means, I thought I had it up here. Yeah. It's got an intensifier, epi, with agonizomai, to contend about a thing as a combatant. It's a military term used to describe an enlisted man in battle, but it's the intense form of it. The effort that should be expended is of the utmost, is what it communicates. I want you to earnestly contend because there's nothing more important to fight for, is what he's saying here. Nothing more important to fight for. This is what Christ said. A time is coming, it has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind that worships the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. You know, if it's not true, God doesn't want it. God can't honor it. I saw on Sunday that God was not willing to change his word even though his son's life was on the line. Why is he going to change it? He can't change who he is. And so if we're going to honor him, I'm going to worship him, and it has to be true. And if we deviate from the truth of the gospel and the Christian life by grace, we're going to lose our full reward, and the things we work for are going to be lost. Do you think in those terms? Do you recognize the value of what we have here from God's perspective? Are you going to ho-hum this stuff? I mean, Pete says you got people here that out in Arizona that came from many churches that were, they were taught poorly, and yet they want to know the truth. You've been taught the truth well here by God's grace. What does it mean to you? Do you value it? Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for and that we may receive a full reward. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we're humbled as we consider the importance of sound doctrine. We consider what John wrote here and what and that love is truly discerning discerning. That love recognizes the truth for what it is, and that love is determined by the truth of the Word of God. Help us to keep all these things straight in our own mind. And that he made the issue in protecting ourselves from false teaching that we love one another and keep your commandments as commandments are kept as we abide in your love. So help us to abide in that love. As, no, as we know, love rejoices in the truth.
and we know the truth sets us free. So help us to see the gravity of this situation, how you view your word, how important it is to you, and since our objective is to worship you in spirit and in truth, that we take this to heart for your glory. So thank you for our study tonight now in Jesus' name. Amen.